So, could you tell us when you when you first heard about the camp? I'm not sure when I first heard about it. Uh, might have been '84, but uh, a girlfriend at the time was going out, and um, maybe that same summer. It's been 22 years. <laughs> I think maybe that same summer, at the end of the summer, I decided to go. And uh, I didn't really know a whole lot about it till I landed there. And you were coming from where? I was coming from Oakland, California, and um, it was just amazing to land there. You know, there was the, the kind of communal kitchen, and everybody was sleeping in tents in the woods. And so it was kind of a mix of powerful women's community next to this depot, next to this army depot that was like, you know, we really perceived as toxic and uh, challenging. So it was like incredible safety next to a really challenging, difficult, antagonistic. There. I did. I, I uh, had a girlfriend there. I think I was chasing her down. She probably had three or four other girlfriends and I missed her. <laughs> <laughs> Wanted to go be one of the many. It was really different. It was, um, you know, it, it was a cultural shift. You had to kind of uh, get into the Peace Camp vibe. You know, the kind of communal eating, communal work. Um, I had done political action before, so that wasn't new, the kind of, the chants, the songs, the focus on action, the, that work. I think it was pretty thrilling. 1985, you know, I only went one summer, and it was a summer that changed my life. It was a really powerful switch from um, growing up in a, a white middle class environment and being um, going through all the things you go through in that world and then breaking through and living a summer with anarchists from Greenham. So I was really influenced by the women who were there that summer. It was a really powerful summer. I came only knowing my girlfriend and I left having a family of and incredible experiences. And some of the most powerful experiences were me for me were the rituals. We did rituals on the land and um, I think that was the first summer I started doing fire walking. And I think over that summer and the next year I did about 12 fire walks. But we did a fire walk there on the land. And um, I think it was just a small group of us, like 10 of us, 12 of us, not very big. But I think we were really focused on working our magic. Use the magic to transform the depot, you know, so you can go over and you can do direct action or you can really work on the ethereal plane and do magic. And we're a powerful group of witches that were there. Um, some of the women I'd worked with for quite a while, so we knew how to do magic. So the fire walk was an incredible uh, time. You know, of course, we're singing and we're chanting and we're raising the energy and we're focusing it on the depot and um, everybody's walking across the fire. It wasn't that big of a fire, but I think at one moment I was so inspired, I threw off my shirt and rolled across it. And what was so cool was that uh, the burn that I got on my shoulder was in the shape of a dragon head. Or at least I was convinced for at least 10 years that the burn on my shoulder was a dragon head. <laughs> But um, a lot of the time, you know, we were talking about, you know, how to live together, how to work together. But what I remember mostly were the actions. I did one action. I, I, um, I had a wicked crush on one of the Greenham women. And um, we got up really early one morning. And we walked down the side of the depot and we took our carpet squares and threw them over and scrambled over. And then we took the fire walking coal the fire walking charcoal and we were headed for their communications tower and we wanted to um, leave a message on the communications tower so we took our fire walking charcoal <laughs> and we walked in the very deep grass through the you know the dew and the cold morning and went to the tower and we wrote you know, all over the tower, transform, peace now, end to war. You know, we wrote all over the cement base. And we kind of looked around, there was nothing more to do. So then we kind of walked out. And right as we got um, to the edge, one of the jeeps started coming around and we were in open, in an open field. So um, the Greenham woman I'm with is much more experienced than me. She goes, go ahead, run. So I run for all I'm worth and, you know, struggle to climb up the chain link fence and go over and throw myself down and <gasps> run across the street and throw myself in a ditch so they can't see me, right? And, I'm <gasps> and she doesn't come behind me. 
she's nowhere. So I'm like, oh no, what do I do? But I know, you know, I just trust. She's from Greenham, she's way smarter than me, you know. So I kind of walk home because you, we didn't want anybody to notice. So I walk back to the house. I'm only about half a mile away. And uh, finally she shows up about an hour later. She had hidden for that time. And the uh, guys in the Jeep had come and checked it out because the carpet was still there, right? And so she had to make her way over the barbed wire without the carpet. And I said, wow, that was a great action, huh? And she looks at me and she says, you are the noisiest person I have ever done anything with. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm hard of hearing. I thought I was so clandestine. I thought I was so brilliant. And I was horribly nice. But a really cool action was when uh, we all went to the front gate. That was, we, we snuck over a couple of times. We snuck over and did rituals. And But, um, to be more forthright, we went in, in the front and we had, you know, we were decked out and we had signs and we chained ourselves and we, to the, uh, some women chained themselves to the gate. Most of us just sat in front, I think we're dragged away. And we sang, we sang and we sang and we sang. Another action that I remember was, again, with two green and women, um, we were going to spray paint. I think we were going to spray paint the, the street in front of the opening of the depot and we're dressed all in black and um, you know I'm a real uh, <laughs> inexperienced anarchist so we had gloves on rubber gloves probably and all dressed in black and we all had our spray paint and we're walking down the side of the street trying to be discreet and the sheriff had just been really pushed to get rid of those you know, peace camp women, they're really a pain in the butt. The army had been really pushing them. So I'm walking along and we start spray painting. Psh, we're spray painting, you know, peace now, no war, the depot must go, whatever it is, we're spray painting. And all of a sudden this car comes up. So for some reason, I whip my rubber gloves off and then I pick up the spray paint and I get paint all over me. But luckily I have a sweatshirt on, so I stick my hands in my sweatshirt. So the sheriff comes over and he, he pulls me into his car and he sits me in the front seat and he goes, what have you been doing? And I lie. Nothing, just, you know, out. He goes, you can't be doing nothing, you know. You from that camp? I would be yeah. He says, well, what do you do? And I said, well, I work with kids. I work with emotionally disturbed kids out in the Bay Area. He goes, you do? You know, I've been having a lot of trouble with my son. I said, tell me about it. So he starts to tell me about his son and the challenges he's having with his son, and I start to coach him and start to give him ideas for how to handle his son. So after about a half hour, he says, go get out of here. I just needed to give you some trouble so the army won't bother me anymore. I'm like, cool, and I like whip my hand out of my sweatshirt with my paint all over it, shake his hand, and jump out of the car. <laughs> and so, yeah, when I came, I had been working at around issues of Vandenberg Air Force Base and you know all the issues that have been out here US out of El Salvador, stop apartheid, I can't remember the order of anything and where peace camp came in you know it was the 80s right it was mid 80s and we were doing all of those and the chants and the songs and the political action work and I had affinity groups here and I'd gone through other trainings and stuff but yeah I had done a, a, a witch's song, I identified myself as a witch and uh, that was what was so amazing about Seneca Women's Peace Camp is everyone, most people were a witch. Maybe not everybody identified, but most of the lesbians did. And uh, we did really powerful ritual and we had fires and, and we all fell in love. You know, everybody fell in love with everyone. Everybody was in love with two, three, five people, you know. And we'd um, sit by the fire and spin stories and spin songs. And was very cool. Yeah, I had just come from doing a, a theater political theater uh, training kind of thing where I did a bunch of work. <laughs> I mean, the truth was there was just so much love. Um, I, what, for me, it was really unveiling, a really opening, a really time of opening my heart because I was really raised in a very patriarchal, very classic. My father's a classic patriarch. I was raised in a very classic middle class, small town, kind of closed hearted spirit. So it, for me it was really an open-hearted thing to really go into 
you know, how could we not? We were all in our 20s. How could we not? We were doing this powerful work, living on the edge, you know, living out and doing work that we felt passionate about. And so, yeah, many people fell in love with many people. And it actually took a lot of time. It actually pulled a lot of energy away. If we truly understood, like some of the women in the circle really understood how to be non-monogamous. But if more of us understood it, we probably would have wasted a lot less time with our feelings, right? Everybody, is so-and-so okay? So-and-so didn't look at so-and-so. Oh! But then what was amazing in 85 is we all went to the uh, Michigan Women's Peace Camp. <laughs> the Michigan Women's Festival. Should have been a peace camp. We made it a festival. We made it a festival. Poor Holly Mears up there singing, We are. What is it? We are a what? People. And we're like, We are an angry rowdy. We're out there, like, you know, protesting Holly Near. You know, we were like, That rad. You know, standing out there going, You know, Peace camp now. Be angry. Be loud. You know, <laughs> sneaking in, half the people snuck in, you know, <laughs> sneak into the women's, you know, <laughs> festival. Tell them about having the peace camp come to your family's house. Oh. Well, then a life altering event was that, uh, yeah, about 15, 15 women oh, came I'm to my small town and uh, my father didn't know I was a lesbian. But uh, he figured it out. Or no, I, yeah, I guess he figured it out. Um, the first thing everybody did when they got to, we had this uh, little cottage on right on Lake Michigan. The first thing everybody did is bring the pull the flag down. Wait, you know. can we just back up? Get how rid of that American flag. How did it come that 15 Peace Camp women... Did, the whole I invited them! You did, okay. <laughs> I invited them. Hey, I live, uh, I live nearby. Y'all want to come to my house? Were you there? I was and I you were there. there. I was there. Were you there? So it made perfect right. Sense. Well, I think I invited everybody. I called home and said, "Hey, can I bring a few friends home?" Sure. You know, so everybody left the the space on the lake, and you know, then people just took it over in our peace camp way. <laughs> and then, oh Lord. Okay, so we go out there, and people start taking down, you know, the flags and making out, you know, everywhere. Everybody's like <laughs> naked and making out everywhere, and so all the neighbors, all the locals, are like stumbling across these women. You know, and then, so it was a couple of days, three or four, and then a carpool of women went to Muskegon, and one of them got arrested for shoplifting and just used my name. It just occurred to her. She just pulled a name out of the air, and it was mine, I think. And so I don't remember how we got out of that one. I do not remember that one. I remember leaving town. My father didn't speak to me for two years, by the way. Wow. Two years. Oops. Which, again, takes a lot of energy to, like, not have somebody talk to you. But two years later, we're good now. We're good. 25 years. 22 years have happened. But then we got into the pickup truck with Amazon Witch sprayed it on side. Has somebody else told this story? Oh, this is a good story. You were there. Yes. No. How many of us? Five or six? We had an open-backed pickup truck. And we just made our way cross-country, liberating gas. At a <laughs> <laughs> We liberated all kinds of things. Uh -huh. Yes, we did. And we found our way to New Mexico, where um, we were totally unconscious about what the word witch meant to the Native American community. So we pull up with our truck with the words Amazon witch. Um, the word witch wasn't seen as a positive thing and I think um, we were told to like fall into culture, fall into community or move on which you know we wanted to be it was a, it was a funky one because somebody had um, buried a skull under one of the four posts somebody had done some bad magic that particular uh, Sundance it was a men and women some dance and uh, it was it was just a little weird you know it was we were trying to blend and try to bring our community but we had to really fall back I think we stayed and then we went we decided we we're gonna to go to the four corners to the D Diné land and support their work there and we showed up um, late at night do you remember this 
and fell, you know, fell asleep out in the land and we woke up to a jet coming over our head. It felt like you could reach up and t touch it. It was the loudest thing I've ever heard in my life. Right there, this jet, right over us because they were, you know, doing their thing. It was near an uh, Air Force base, I assume. So just as we're waking up, you know, a little dehydrated, hadn't really gotten up or handled anything, the sheep are out. Oh, <laughs> we're going to go help get the sheep. <laughs> all these peace camp women from all over the world. <laughs> like six of us are going to go help and herd these sheep. Well, we start after the women whose land it is, you know, we start after, and you know, the sheep are like miles away. We're in the desert. I don't think I've ever been more thirsty in my entire life. We were so dehydrated, we got sick. And so we ended up not only not helping, the we sheep. were like, trouble! You know, we like showed up, got dehydrated in the first couple hours. Yeah. So it was an adventure. It was a transformative adventure, absolutely. And, you know, kind of started with all the actions at Seneca. I'm sure there were many more, but those were the few. Maybe some of you remember some. I don't know. But, um, and then we went to the Michigan Festival, and then we traveled across the country. Then we went to New Mexico, and then we just kind of disbanded. I went hitchhiked back to California with one other woman. But it totally changed my world. Well, I think I really, um got the values much more deeply embedded to me embedded in me to really question the patriarchy to understand how to do actions to um, you certainly got a lot of practice in magic um, I think it really aligned my values kind of cleared away some of the cobwebs cleared away some of my old beliefs so it impacted me very personally I, I can't remember the kind of the chronological, you know, the actions after that. I'm sure I stayed in the mix. I mean, I'm still in the mix. I have two little kids. I I took my daughter when she was two to one of the actions. But it was really hard. It's hard to have an infant at an action. You know, change diapers, deal with everything while you're in the middle of a couple hundred thousand people. You know, it just becomes literal. <laughs> hmm. Well... I would like to say it maybe had more impact. I'm kind of, I'm, I'm, I live a middle class life now, pretty much. I have a house, I have a car, I recycle, I vote progressively, you know. I'm conscious, but I'm not on the radical front line, I'm not, I, I live in magic now. It's wired in me to know spirit and work with spirit. But I'm not on the edge anymore. I'm not living in community in that way. I miss it. I love that. Why don't you all just stay right here and we'll... <laughs> I don't sing the songs as much. I miss the songs. Oh, my God. I used to know hundreds of songs. We'd sit. I knew every song, every tune. I love to sing. So I'd say it really cha changed me personally, really radicalized me. And I can't say that I live that anymore. I just remembered when I came back in 85, I immediately started martial arts. That's how I, how I started. Mm -hmm. I, and then I studied martial arts for 16 years. Uh -huh. And I also studied shamanic, feminist shamanic healing mm -hmm. for about eight years or so and then taught it. So I think that's what it was. <laughs> that's what I did. Uh -huh. I became a martial artist and a, you know, kind of a shamanic healer, a hands-on shamanic uh -huh. healer. And I did that for probably 15 years. So I, did, I kept teaching myself skills. I know I was conscious of thinking, you know, the world will be coming to an end and we'll all need to be able to heal and transform um, at that time. So I gathered skills. I also did clowning at that point. So I kind of just got involved in theater, healing, martial arts, and working with kids. So I was very industrious. But, um, I don't remember... You know, I'm sure some people were a pain in the ass. That doesn't stick out to me, though. Yeah. You know, I'm sure we were trying to come to consensus. I'm sure there were a lot of annoying processes. I'm sure the food sucked 
periodically. Well, but it was just such a time of passion and joy that that doesn't stick out in my yeah. feeble memory. Was it? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Plenty of times. What, what do we do? I could just remember we went back. We were going to try to cut through the gate with, you know, cut, cut through the fence. What are those things called? Bolt cutters. Bolt cutters. Right. I'm sure we've got a song with bolt cutter in it, right? <laughs> we were trying to cut into the back gate at one point and trying to get in. Yeah, you know, you didn't want to be caught. Plenty of times. Lots of fear. I think I don't remember that so much. We lived with a lot of bravado. Don't you think? Yeah. We, were, we were just tough ass girls thinking we were indestructible. Uh-huh. But yeah, there was a lot of fear. It'd be great. You know, I really wanted a I really wanted a daughter and prayed very hard, manifested her because uh, somebody told me we we were told we were gonna have a son. And so we had a daughter and then we were gonna have a second child and I was like, Oh shit. But you know what? I love that little boy. I just he's just love. I'm just so thrilled with him. But we were separatists there for a while, you know in the camp and after that but um and I really wanted a girl child and I'm happy I have one because she's a live wire she's going to change the world I have no doubt so I will tell her the stories you know but I'll tell her them within a context that I think she can understand I don't think you know it's not time to take it in we don't really bring war into our house right now (laughs) we don't bring the struggle we don't bring the war we don't bring the hatred which is what we were counterbalancing but I'm really happy to, to raise a, a sweet little boy. So we'll see. Hopefully everything... I, I felt when she was born that everything I've learned is to raise her. Uh-huh. And so it's the same for my son, though. So I'd say that's also influenced me. Yeah. Well, I don't think I'm wired to be separatist. I'm not really wired to, in the same way I spoke about my father or the other thing, I'm not wired to repel something. That's not what I'm about. I'm a naturalist. You bury things. You move them out of toxicity. You transform. And so to be a separatist, you actually have to spend the energy to keep yourself away from. Now, I certainly have evolved my world where I have, you know, very few men, very few men friends. But I I worked with a lot of men, and I worked with a lot of boy children. And some of them were really okay. So to me, in my personal life, um... It was comfortable to make the choice. I mean, when I was younger, I was very conscious about not allowing the toxicity in the same way that I don't feed the spirit of Jesus. You know, Jesus gets enough juice in this lifetime. Let's feed the sphere and send energy to the goddess because they're all alive, whether it's Buddha or Jesus or the goddess or Kuan Yin. They're all alive. It's what you, in my world, the fabric, what the the quilt or the fabric is, what do you pull... There, there's this incredible quilt, and we're just pulling on a tiny little thread. So which threads do I want to vibrate and pull on? I want to vibrate the goddess. I want to vibrate women. I want to vibrate healthy children and in, in conscious transformation. I don't want to vibrate, you know, I don't want to push hate or exclusion because I have to feed it, you know. And so all that toxicity, all the magic that we did was to transform the depot, which happened, right? It was transformed. It was turned into something else. We turned, you know, bombs into flowers. And that's the incredible magic of women's power, is to do that long-lasting, deep energy work. And some people don't believe in magic. And that is something I'm teaching my daughter to understand. And it's a little hard, you know, because magic is not always tangible. It takes time to manifest. But she has a magic wand. And we throw papers up and watch it fly. Look, it's magic. (laughs) <laughs> and we do rituals and she has a rattle and you know and we did rituals when they were born so I think that's that's the work that's the legacy to to honor and allow to let the river pass to not get stuck I think the funniest thing about separatism to me was uh, at one point when I was just understanding what it was I said you mean I can't like John Denver <laughs> that tells you how long ago. Whether you're separatist or not, you can't like John. Yeah. Oh, oh, well, now I understand I absolutely that. disagree. You can he's got some good songs. You know, he's got some okay songs. Yeah. I, I fill up my incredible. senses, you know. Yeah. We'll have to have a gather song of John Denver tunes. Just John Denver. Would you lead it? Sure. Leaving on a jet plane was one of the first songs I ever learned on the guitar. Leaving on a jet plane. Any song. 
Yeah. West Virginia, take me home, you know? What, what kind of song? Anyway, we don't have to be labor yeah. that. That was just meant to be funny. And yeah. then it was. That's I'm not just... funny. It's <laughs> <laughs> not funny. I am a healer. And these are my hands. My hands work the, with the balance of light and darkness. My breath is my center. With breath, I like the fire. The fire is my heart, and the heart is my home. I go to the fields to gather weeds and grasses and bundle them to dry. And with these healing herbs, I heal, I transform. But few come now as they are frightened of what the priests will say. Learned doctors and scholars try to take away our power for the church sanctions murder gay women and good witches killed by loyal decree soon they will come to my door and with my sisters I ready my escape for together we will transform our power we are the flow and we are the ebb. We are the weavers, we are the web. The goddess was dismembered, but I will remember her. I will remember her. Remember.